Well, hello and welcome everyone to On the Horizon with President Pribinow. My name is Sarah Erkinen and I serve as Assistant Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Augsburg. Today you'll get to hear from President Pribinow and also from current Regent Nancy Mueller. We're gonna welcome your questions and your um, conversation today after Paul completes um, sharing some information with you all. And you can really share those questions and comments in this chat window, or you can really just unmute and, and share what's on your mind um, since we have a, a group conducive to that today. And this is being recorded. We've had numerous requests for that today and um, closed captioning is available to you. So welcome again, and now I'm going to ask Nancy to share a few thoughts. Thanks, Sarah. And I just wanna thank everyone for taking time out of their day to uh, be with us and learn what's happening at Augsburg. Uh, we're asking you uh, to be here today to um, not only learn what's happening at Augsburg, but also for us to stay connected to you. Um, everything has been uh, a challenge this past year, as you well know, and I just wanted to um, share that I am so proud of how, how Augsburg has not only uh, risen to the challenge, but they've far exceeded my expectations and um, we should all be so proud of the hard work that has gone on on campus. And um, I'm just thrilled to um, for the news that you're going to hear today from, from Paul. Um, one of the things I'm so proud about uh, how Augsburg has handled, there's so many things that they had to adjust to and they adjusted quickly and um, they not from online um, education to um, dealing with uh, COVID and um, having to go to, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> all the challenges that have gone with COVID um, in, including um, adapting um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my place. <laughs> uh, in, in, including dealing with all the unrest during the protests. Augsburg has not only uh, supported their students, but they've excelled in it from um, helping them address mental health issues and their financial e needs, but to keeping them safe. And uh, Augsburg has kept its promise of being small to its students and and big to the world. So I don't wanna steal any more of Paul's thunder um, because it's not only has this great, last year been a great success, but I'm so looking forward to what uh, is going to be happening next year and the years to come. So Paul, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thanks for your service and for the continuing the Mueller family legacy and leadership at Augsburg. And, um, it's great to be with uh, all of you this morning. I appreciate your taking time to, to join us. Um, uh, certainly I share Nancy's um, uh, hopes and aspirations for the future, because let me just tell you, having lived through this past year, <laughs> you know, I want some fun on the other side. I think most of you know that I just signed a six year contract uh, renewal. And I, I say, if I didn't retire a year ago, I at least want to stay uh, with it and see what fun we can have going forward. And I think we're going to have lots of fun because in fact, we learned lots of important lessons. We've built a strong foundation and I'm really excited about where we're headed. So um, we always wanna start with this beautiful picture of the Hagford Center. And uh, it's been, um, for me, it's really meaningful over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing some uh, in-person uh, coffee uh, conversations with various folks and we, we get a cup of coffee at the Christensen Center and then we wander over to the Hagford Center and go up into one of the spaces. And it's a little eerie because of course it's empty um, and it has been empty pretty much throughout the year, but it's just a reminder of uh, the importance of this facility, this building, both philanthropically, what it meant for us, what it means for all of our students and faculty to have 
to access this beautiful building um, and from the way that it really has uh, positioned our reputation, I think, as a place that uh, is committed to the kind of intersection of the disciplines that are in this building, but also the way the building really symbolizes our mission and our commitment to the neighborhood. So um, I always like to come back and I can't wait to have that building filled with students and faculty again, I hope uh, as uh, recent, uh, as early as this summer and going into the fall. So I uh, want to start just by uh, this next slide, uh, TJ. Um, kind of lays out uh, some way the framework for how we've been thinking about this work. As so you know, just uh, what 14 months ago, uh, on May 15th, we made the decision, and, and I think some of you were on the call that um, uh, that I did last uh, summer on some of these things. And what we had to do, we pivoted everything online. We sent all of our students home, and of course, to be quite honest, in retrospect, that was one of the worst things we could have done uh, because it probably was safer to keep them here, but that's what we did at that moment. And then we finished that spring semester as strong as we could. Um, we were able to do a virtual commencement, but started immediately thinking about the challenges of the year that we've just finished. And, um, and really, as you likely know, we basically moved 90% uh, of our classes online. Um, uh, of course, there were challenges with student uh, athletes and, and whether we could have sports seasons, uh, music, uh, so all the things that were sort of signature to Augsburg, we had to shift and think differently about those. What I would say, and we're going to certainly touch on a few of these things in this presentation, is that this is a community that did, as Nancy said, they, they uh, rose up and, and met those challenges, leaned into those challenges, uh, and did it in a variety of ways. So uh, we finished this year strong. Um, Financially, uh, enrollment-wise, uh, and and I really feel like also the work that was done this after this past year actually does set a foundation as we move into the next academic year. Um, uh, I have to say that um, you know the, the sort of things that have been going on over the last couple of weeks in terms of the virus and taking away requirements has created a bit more complexity for us as we think about the summer and the fall, but at the same time, uh, this is a community that knows uh, that next year is really going to be uh, an on-ramp to our ongoing sustainability and thriving. And so what can we take from our experience in these past 15 months and build in to our planning uh, as we go forward? So let's um, talk a little bit about uh, what uh, some of the highlights, I think, in this next slide is sort of a mosaic of, oh, well, it, it actually, we always start here uh, because I really believe that it's important for us to understand that the work we've been able to do this past year, this past 15 months, has been grounded in this strategic plan that I think, as most of you know, was adopted by the Board of Regents um, uh, at the, its October 2019 meeting. So, so here was the plan that at the beginning of our sesquicentennial year, the Board adopted the result of two years of work leading up to this plan. And I love that vision statement that uh, we had uh, affirmed there, the new kind of urban student-centered university, educating our students as stewards of an inclusive democracy, engaged in their communities and uniquely equipped to navigate the complex issues of our time. Right there, I mean, we capture what we're about um, and what we aspire to. And I have to think that in this year, could we imagine a more complex set of issues um, out in the world that we are actually equipping our students to lean into? So we have really taken the various, the pandemics, the public health crisis, the economic disruption, the racial reckoning, and we've, we've leaned into those issues and, and, and with our students really thought about, you know, what are we doing and preparing you, equipping you to go out and be leaders in this world? And, and then the, the, the three broad strategic goals that we have here, strengthening our three-dimensional education, advancing the public purposes of knowledge, Augsburg education and growing as a sustainable university have given us a framework uh, for much of the work that we've done this past year. Um, and so I give thanks as other institutions were casting aside strategic plans. Augsburg actually was leaning in the strategic plan that I believe um, is uh, right on target and really is the foundation for our future um, growth and sustainability. So to the next slide, TJ, I do think I have a slide here with some first pictures on it. Here it is. Um, so this is a mosaic of uh, just the kinds of things that were going on campus throughout the year. So go back to last summer, and there's that picture in the upper left uh, <clears throat> where a variety of us faculty and staff uh, uh, set out across the Twin Cities region to deliver uh, these signs to incoming Augsburg students. So there I was with a young woman who was going to be entering um, Augsburg, uh, albeit in a kind of odd way, but uh, we wanted them to have that sense of connection and sense of belonging. And it was, I was able to deliver seven or eight of those signs. And uh, as I say, we did. Uh, you know, dozens of them across the Twin Cities. And it's fun to sometimes drive down the street and still see them in somebody's front yard. Um, we did have people working on campus. So you see the enrollment services, places that were student facing. We had, uh, you know, skeleton crew, but uh, uh, folks that were here pretty consistently. Um, um, you see in the bottom left there, we were able to use outdoor spaces both in the fall and a little bit uh, in the spring uh, to kind of get students feeling like, again, that they could you know, be in person uh, safely in some ways. Um, 
of course, that you see in the variety of places there um, uh, where our students were active in, especially some of the uh, protests and the like, they were leaning into their commitments to anti-racism and to equity uh, as they really fought for justice. Um, uh, we were able to take uh, our, as most of you probably saw, our 31 minute uh, Advent Vespers, 41st annual Vespers. And there was this small group of us that were out in the quadrangle in the snow singing Silent Night that was the conclusion of that. And so just a sign of imagination and, and creativity that people showed when we couldn't be together in person, how could we do still bring something that was signature to Augsburg to uh, folks and thousands of people have watched that 31 minute video, which was so powerful. Um, as I mentioned, student athletes were able to practice throughout the year and we ultimately did get seasons in for almost all of our student athletes uh, kind of truncated winter season um, uh, we, we played football a couple times in april of all times <laughs> played volleyball in april um, uh, and then the uh, last thing i'll point to is uh, the woman in the bottom middle there uh, that's dr alicia quella and she is the head of our pa program but she's also a phd in epidemiology and so she has become just a fundamental guide to everything we've done this year we give thanks for her, both her wisdom and experience and the ways that she leaned into helping us, uh, in addition to running her own program, helping the entire institution to think about how we could keep each other safe uh, throughout the year. So, so just a glimpse into uh, life at Augsburg uh, over the past uh, year. So um, next slide, I think, uh, gives you uh, some of that good news that Nancy pointed to. This is um, uh, just to, to remind you, um, we, um, two years ago, fall of 2019, the beginning of our 150th anniversary, uh, we had the largest entering class in Augsburg's history, first year students. Um, and um, last fall, we had the second largest entering class in Augsburg's history. Um, and as you can see in this chart, as of this week, um, we are actually running uh, ahead of last year uh, by a significant uh, 60 to by that, that orange bar that runs through the middle. So 591 um, deposits, net deposits to date. Um, we believe that we will come in um, around 600 students for this fall. So it will be the second largest class in Augsburg's history. Um, we ended up uh, uh, in 2019, we ended up at 636. So that's what where we netted out in that year. Uh, last year, we ended up about 550. So just to give you some sense of, um, of the success, and just think about that, an admissions office that has continued to operate almost entirely remotely and yet have been able to uh, really deliver these results. We're also very pleased to see that the deposit numbers for transfers are holding pretty much steady uh, with last year, despite uh, the fact that we've had fewer applications there. But uh, again, we're, we're really seeing a kind of a, for those of you who've been on this board in the past decades, you know that what this is really representing is a pretty significant uh, uptick in what our base undergraduate number is. So that number has hovered between 1900 and 2100 for most of the last uh, uh, decade. And now we're seeing uh, with these large classes coming in kind of an uptick where that's uh, 2200, maybe 2300 that we will have. So uh, clearly a sign that our reputation is attracting students and that we um, are really being able to make what is also, of course, a financial move as a result of that. Maybe this next slide, I think, gives you just a glimpse of a couple of uh, the ways in which that enrollment mission staff was really active. So they were doing uh, virtual events, of course. Uh, uh, TJ, who's our tech on this call, has had a full-time job at Augsburg this past year because he's been helping us to put all of these, uh, you know, all of these events together, um, uh, using social media very aggressively with our students. Um, I did do an in-person. You see it's not a very good picture there, but the picture on the right is um, the uh, cohort of our Act 6 program, which is one of our pipeline programs uh, into the college uh, that we partner with Urban Ventures uh, with. Phil Sterling, who's on the call, knows that program very well. And this was our, um, um, I believe, our seventh cohort that we're bringing into Augsburg. There will, there will be seven of them total. There were only four that night at that event, but we're over at the Crystal Ray High School. And how proud I was to welcome them and to hand them an Augsburg sweatshirt and just be reminded that that's that's the kind of thing we've done over the past 10 years. We've created these partnerships with other organizations that create pipelines that bring students to us that otherwise might not uh, even be um, known to us. And so we've really seen great success with some of those pipeline programs in the enrollment office. So let's look uh, quickly on um, the issues around COVID. Um, so the hot topic, of course, right now are vaccines. Um, and, um, and as you all know, uh, with the governor's decision to undo the mask mandate and to uh, pull back on almost all the other restrictions. In some ways, what's happened is this has left those decisions now to individual institutions. Um, 
and on vaccines, you know, the, the, the kind of dynamic that's going on, of course, is between those that are mandating them um, or those that are strongly encouraging. Nobody is against vaccines, but uh, as an institution, but we are on, I think there are two different tracks there. Um, and you probably here in Minnesota, you know that uh, at this point, I think three of our private uh, sister institutions have announced that they are going to mandate the vaccine. And that is Carlton and McAllister and Gustavus. We also know that the Minneapolis College of Art and Design is going to mandate. Um, uh, I am leaning toward not uh, mandating. Um, but I am leading toward a very strong uh, encouragement, uh, a capturing of vaccine status from all faculty, staff, and students, and then a, a really aggressive campaign to make vaccines accessible. I, um, I'm persuaded by the challenge that we have with the students that we primarily serve. And as you know, we've now become uh, majority BIPOC students, that the communities from which many of our students come um, have histories of medical trauma. Um, and it's not that I, they don't want them to have the vaccine, but I want to make sure that we can work with them toward building a trust relationship that would lead them to want to have the vaccine and understand that it's safe. And we feel like if we mandate, we in some ways uh, uh, potentially lift up that trauma. And so that's that's the challenge we have right now. I have to say we have done a great job of getting people vaccinated. And I, I actually think once we capture that information, we will find that a very large percentage of our population is already vaccinated. So that will create a opportunity then for us in the fall to come back much more fully uh, in person than we might have even imagined a couple months ago. Um, I mean, we are potentially looking at not having the distance in the classrooms uh, to be able to undo the mask mandate for those who are vac uh, vaccinated, to get back to more regular um, activities, especially in um, athletics. Um, uh, though I think there will be some mandated um, percentages probably in things like athletics, probably in music. Um, so that may, there may be some subsets of students that we actually do mandate the vaccine if they want to participate in those kind of activities. So, and the NCAA will probably provide some guidance for that for us, uh, especially with student athletes. So, um, so that we can talk, if you have questions about the other COVID uh, related issues, I'm happy to you know, answer those here, but let's um, maybe go to this next slide. Um, and, uh, and what we've uh, been able to focus on in the strategic plan um, this year is actually the the third of the strategic objectives to grow as a sustainable university. And I, I have to say that um, the results of, it's not just one year's work, but a couple years work in that category that were presented to the board back at its meeting on May 1st are incredibly impressive. I mean, I just have to say that um, uh, work led by regents, by Provost Cavola, by faculty, staff, others have been involved, they came forward uh, with three significant chunks of work that truly do set an uh, incredible foundation for us as we move into the next year. And we're proud to share that with the board. And I think on the next slide, you get kind of a quick glimpse of, of three uh, of those broad areas of work. Um, uh, back in November, we established a growth sustainability task force uh, that set up um, uh, really a focus on driving net revenue. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those action areas in a second. Um, Provost Kaibola led with a group of faculty, a whole task force on academic structure. I think you, uh, most of you will remember that when we changed our name, we did not change our academic structure, but we asked the faculty to enter into a process, which has been led over the past couple of years by Provost Kaibola to think about the best way for us to organize ourselves to meet the needs of our students. And then the third piece, which really has to do with culture change, um, is how we um, uh, you know, develop an even more sophisticated analytics, academic analytics pro program to be able to really drive a culture of learning and results. And so um, on the next slide, you see the four action areas that came out of uh, the recommendations for the Grow uh, Sustainability Task Force. And so the first is to enhance our distinction as an inclusive institution of choice for undergraduate students. And in this regard, we are really focusing on our commitment to equity and inclusion in particular, um, uh, but also our location, um, also, you know, what, why do students come to us? And we are actually engaged right now in a two-year comprehensive uh, market positioning study that is going to help us to understand why we are an institution of choice and what are our distinctions in the market and how can we even strengthen and enhance those. Um, we also, out of the group, came with a focus on undergraduate retention. Um, and this was a, a you know, really continues to be a, a, a way that we think about how we not only bring students to Augsburg, but we get them through Augsburg, to and through becomes an important piece. So a whole set of initiatives there, including um, perhaps um, 
some different pathways to graduation and maybe a five-year pathway for many of our students that have family situations or work situations where they need to think differently about their path through if we could actually show them that path on the front end we may not lose them along the way. Um, there are also some really uh, strong cultural issues there around how we create a sense of belonging. Uh, and, and so some really significant work that I think um, uh, could be very valuable for us because we all know, and I think you all remember, it's much less expensive to keep a student than it is to, re to uh, enroll a new student. And so uh, the, the higher we can have our retention rates, the uh, better it is for our overall financial well-being. Um, there was a special focus in on graduate enrollment. Um, as you know, we now have expanded those programs with doctoral programs in nursing and in psychology, clinical psychology. Uh, but we're trying to think about capacity that we still have available in some of our programs. That, uh, those programs tend to wax and wane depending on what's going on in the world. So right now, uh, MBAs are down, um, education, uh, social work are up. Um, so trying to think about how we continue to balance and manage uh, those different programs together. And then finally, uh, an area that I think is really exciting for us, and that is how can we have a focus on working adults um, and think about learning that is, uh, as you see, they're unbounded by geography, modality, or degree options. One of the things we've learned over the past 15 months is that we are perfectly capable of moving uh, really high quality education into a virtual um, modality. And so it was, it's been exciting. I've taught a couple of classes in the spring and, you know, there's a student in Africa, there's a student, uh, you know, in Texas, there's a student in California. And so, especially for working adults, how could we use what we've learned about technology and the use of technology as a teaching tool to actually expand our ability to um, recruit students? Um, and, you know, we're still going to have a core traditional uh, undergraduate program that, you know, counts on a certain face-to-face, -to -face, but I think in particular for working adults, we've learned that we need to think uh, much more flexibly about what we can do uh, to meet their needs. So under each of these, there's a set of very concrete initiatives that, we're, that we are organizing, but this, this truly was uh, a huge body of work that we um, really needed to get done and really now becomes the map for uh, moving forward. On the next slide, we see just a quick um, kind of, this gets into the weeds a little bit more than perhaps uh, we need to, but uh, this idea of academic analytics, um, uh, we uh, did create an Office of Planning and Effectiveness about six or seven years ago, and this now broadens that. Uh, to use um, a set of tools that um, that would really inform decisions about uh, the number of classes we offer, about uh, about the number of faculty we have in particular academic programs, and so this uh, and this Provost Kaibola has really been a champion of this and has recruited a, a deans that have really uh, got a focus here. And as you see in that last bullet, for me, what's important here is that. This does help us to cultivate a different culture, an expanded culture, a culture of learning and results, um, which uh, together with our current culture, which we all agree is purpose and caring, and as Karen says over and over again, I, nobody's going to argue against purpose and caring. It's what makes Longford special. But we do uh, need to think about how we also become more data-driven, and this is really going to help us to be able to do that. Um, and then the final um, uh, piece of work that was done here uh, is on this next slide, um, and that is the, the move to a two-college uh, structure. Um, so this represents uh, the work of this faculty group. This is as far as they brought this project. This now has uh, additional work that will be done in the fall by uh, faculty groups. But what this would create is a College of Art and Sciences under a dean, um, and then a College of Professional Studies under a dean. And then what will happen um, in the course of the next several months is that faculty will name under each of those colleges different divisions, uh, and some of that work uh, is already underway. You know, what this really opens up is uh, is, is an op a couple of different opportunities. One, to make sure that decisions being made about academic programs are being made by the right people, so it's a governance issue. Um, but it's also, I'll be quite honest, it's an opportunity for philanthropy um, because we have an opportunity now to think about, for example, under a College of Art and Sciences, do we have a school of music? Um, and is there somebody that you know is interested in naming a school of music? Under the College of Professional Studies, do we have a school of business that perhaps has a, a, a family name on it? Um, uh, in addition to the two college structure, there are also those little ovals in the middle are some additional uh, pieces. So you see the Office of Planning and Effectiveness there that I mentioned that was linked to the academic analytics. But then also um, the creation of a center for adult learning and continuing education. We are seeing a real opportunity in the market to take a lot of what we do well and 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 turn it into uh, certificate programs, uh, non other non degree programs. Uh, that if if we had an infrastructure to support the marketing of those, we have the content. It's not an issue about content, but it would be an issue about how we how we get it to market. And we are really excited about this. So you think about our 
equity inclusion work, you think about our interfaith work, uh, uh, work we're doing with congregations, all of those efforts um, really give us content that needs to be pushed out and we believe uh, would be of great value and interest to people uh, in the broader community. So, uh, so we're excited about how this structure, which really should be, I think, in place uh, probably by uh, the beginning of the uh, 23 academic, 22, 23 academic year, so we have about a year to get it fully up and running here. But, um, I think I've got a couple more slides to share before we open it up. Um, I, I get asked this question, so I'm not sure, especially as a group of, of, of regents of Marston, you would be interested in um, in this question about uh, how we weathered these crazy years. This this particularly looks at uh, what the current year and this coming year, and specifically what this uh, shows you is the value that we um, uh, placed on receiving the federal funds. Um, and as you know, uh, this doesn't include uh, 20, where we actually did the original CARES Act. We also, we received 3.2 million there, 1.6 million, which was available uh, for institutional needs and 1.6 million that went directly to students. So that actually allowed us to finish fiscal 20 um, with meeting our budget metrics. Uh, this year, this is the forecast for this current year, which as you know, uh, concludes here in the next uh, week and a half, um, where we received, um, almost 5 million uh, in support from those, uh, what they call HERF funds now. Um, in that case, 3.3 million of that was available for students, I mean, for uh, institutional needs and 1.6, the same amount from the CARES Act for students. And so what we do with the student money is they apply for it, it's student emergency funding. And so we're able to distribute that to the students who had the greatest need. But those institutional funds then, as you can see, really allowed us again to meet our budget metric, which at this point is really focused on the bottom the little green box there, which is our um, debt ratio, which uh, we need to be at above 1.25. And with uh, this good year that we've had with this extra support, uh, we will be at around 1.6. So very positive news there. Uh, our, going into next year then, of course, we have the latest HERF funds. Um, we received almost 9 million um, in that latest round, uh, and that had to be split half and half again. So about 4.4 that'll go directly to students and the 4.5 that's available. And we. We think we're gonna need that because there will be lost revenue this summer. We will not be fully up to speed on auxiliary revenue. And we are seeing uh, some softness in the housing context. So we are a little bit worried that students aren't ready yet to move back onto campus. Um, and so we need to account for the fact that that of course represents a pretty significant amount of our um, auxiliary revenue. So this uh, funding that's available um, for this next year will really help us to, um, uh, to weather that. And so I go back to my first slide you know, 28, 21, 22, from a financial perspective, those federal funds have allowed us to meet the budget metrics for three straight years. And then it's our job after that, because there won't be any more federal money, then it's our job to come out of next year um, as that on ramp to be able to know that we can be sustainable going forward. And we have some wonderful financial modeling that's been done to really allow us to, to know what we have to do to get there. So, um, and then I think my final slide here is uh, just a point to um, um, go to the next slide, TJ. Um, is to point to the uh, success we've had uh, philanthropically. Um, can we get that next slide up, I think? Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, for a lot of institutions, uh, again, in the middle of the pandemic, how do you stay connected to people? And I just have to say that our advancement staff, um, I'm sure most of you have experienced this, have done a wonderful job of using technology to stay connected. We're using events like this. Um, actually, we estimated the number of people who participated in the On the Horizon events last uh, summer, the ones that I did last summer, and we had more people participating than we would have had at homecoming in person. So this has worked as a way of staying connected. And then people have given um, uh, to the things that, that matter. Um, so the, the maroon box shows you the results from our Give to the Max day last November, where we raised over 530000 for 41 different projects. So faculty and staff that stepped forward and said, I want to get some support for this particular program. I think about 120 of that, 120,000 of that went to athletics, but there was money for interfaith work, there was money for Campus Kitchen, there was money for the Health Commons. So just a wonderful way for us to go out and tell our story through various perspectives and then have folks step up and support that. Um, we are now up as part of the Great Returns Campaign to 100 new endowed scholarships. As we know, our goal there is 150. Um, People have been very generous to our new critical race and ethnic, ethnic studies program, including scholarship support for students and research support for our uh, faculty that will be joining us. Uh, there was a lot of money given to a student emergency fund that was created. Our Augsburg Women Engaged group uh, specifically focused on our um, campus cupboard, which is our 
um, our food pantry for our students because we know that some of our students are food insecure and so we need to be able to continue to meet their needs. And then I would just say a special word of thanks uh, actually to several people on this call in particular to Mark Eustis, uh, Mark and Marjorie Eustis who have uh, helped to establish a presidential strategic fund which had allowed me then to direct um, some significant support to some of the priority projects that aren't included in our operating budget. And so it's just been a way um, to give me that discretion and that flexibility, and I'm so grateful for that. And I know that we will continue to be able to use those funds um, again to, to do the things that really um, sustain Augsburg's kind of key commitments. So, so uh, thanks to all of you for your continued support. And again, um, the, the campaign itself is now up about close to $66 million. So it's really a, done very, very well overall. It's the largest amount ever raised in the capital campaign, and we have a long distance to go. So we will be opening it up um, probably in a much more public phase here sometime over the next year and, and, and still believe that we potentially could get um, well up over 100 million, if not to 150 million, which uh, would be a great number to be able to cap off um, even a delayed finish to our sesquicentennial year. <laughs> One of the saddest things for me is that we had all these wonderful projects that people had worked on during the sesquicentennial year that we intended to bring to the public, you know, late in the spring semester. Well, of course, once we closed down, we couldn't do that. So I really hope that we will sometime probably in the next uh, year be able to plan an event that where we can uh, bring some of those projects uh, and, and show the good work that people did to celebrate that 150th anniversary, even as we move into our next sesquicentennial. Uh, so so that uh, is the end of my formal report and we can, um, I'm happy to answer any questions folks have or um, comments. Hey Paul, Paul, this is Phil, how are you? I'm doing well, Phil, good to see you. Happy spring. Well done, my friend. I mean, you're the archetype of uh, resilient leadership, okay? <laughs> Uh, so well done. Permanent pivoting, as they say, and I've been watching you from a distance and uh, well done to navigate the storm. Uh, so just so I'm clear, so right now for fall, you're, it's back to filling up the dorms, everybody back on campus to the extent that they will. Is that, is that the plan? Yeah, so we, um, we're still waiting for recommendations because they won't be requirements, but there will be recommendations from NDH on, on at different levels of vac vaccination rates, what can you do safely? Um, and so uh, our sense is that if we do are able to document, uh, you know, let's say 80% vaccination rate, we will be able to open up classrooms and um, offices in a much more normal way. Um, I, I think the challenge right at the moment is we don't know what that rate is. And so we are just about to go alive with a process that will capture vaccination status from faculty, staff, and students. Um, and then we'll be able to kind of get an aggregate number for where we stand. Um, but yeah, that we are operating under uh, moving off of modified, modified operations officially as of the middle of August, and then uh, welcoming um, as many students uh, as we can in the fall, as I said. Will they come back to the residence halls? That's still an open question. I think um, I think we hope we can make the case that it will be normal enough for them to come back. Um, but one of the things that we've learned over the last several years is that of course, for many of our students, those costs, as much as we value what residence life can do, those costs of living in the residence halls, and of course then having a, a food contract in addition, sometimes that's the, that's the piece that if they can stay at home, um, you know, they can save that money. And so it also becomes a financial decision for them. So, um, but on the other hand, we own, you know, thousand beds and we've got to fill those beds up to have that stream of, uh, of uh, you know, auxiliary revenue coming in, or we have to make other decisions about that. So um, uh, it's a, you know, it's a it, tricky, you know, the housing stock we own is such an interesting mix. You know that, I mean, you've got the right. traditional dorm and you've got those kind of weird apartments in Morton's, and then you have all that wonderful, you know, townhouses and apartments in Anderson and Luther, and then, you know, the lofts over in, in Oren, and and so we don't have any trouble filling up Luther or, you know, um, or Oren, but, you know, the two-person bathroom down the hall, it still can be a tough sell, you know, for right. grown up with their own bedroom and <laughs> their own bathroom. So, um, so on that timeline, Paul, then kind of your next step is to determine which flavor of the vaccine model that you're going to land on yeah. right yeah. i would guess yeah yeah we will by the end of this month in fact probably make a determine we, we will put a policy out and then we will start capturing all that information so that we know um as quickly as possible 
where we stand as a community. Um, and then and we we basically claim, we've said on the registrar's you know list every class right now is in theory face to face. Um, but then we will start to work based on those vaccination rates and what we need to do uh, to shift those. And and that's the beauty of the, the faculty members have now done their courses online, so they have to shift either because of their personal reasons or because, in fact, we have to worry about density. Um, they now have the capacity to do that, which they did not. To be quite honest, it was tough last summer. So, um, um, but you know, you, I think this group will appreciate this. I know most of you on this call know Diane Pike, you know, a longtime wonderful sociology professor, total Luddite. I mean, top, before, the, before the pandemic, total Luddite. I mean, she did, wouldn't even allow students to have you know, phones or computers in the classroom. Um, so she gets up sometime mid-year, and of course now it's shift all the class and she says, I, I'm a convert, she says. <laughs> so she learned that you can in fact use the technology to teach effectively. And she, um, you know, it, that, that's important to have those kind of voices because Oxford, you know, has not leaned into that uh, online as much as other institutions. And I think we've lost um, some market share as a result of that because we have product, we have content that we ought to be getting out there. And if we can do it virtually, as I mentioned on the, working adult side, I think that can serve us very well, so. Excellent. Hey, Paul, it's Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, you know, one of the questions we were engaged in active discussion was just fully understanding why students were selecting Augsburg. <laughs> I mean, great to have the enrollment, right? We're really excited about it. I know you've embarked on some pretty aggressive work to really get down into the details of why people actually decide to come to Augsburg and engaged a consulting company to help you with that work. Are there any early learnings from that yet? Or what's the status of all that work? Yeah, so, so the work uh, commenced about two months ago and it involved mostly work building um, the kind of research tool that they're going to use. And so that work um, has now just this week gone into the field. Um, so they uh, they built a the whole research model uh, based on what folks here, faculty, staff, students, big advisory groups and regions, um, about what we think the distinctions are of Augsburg. Um, so that got turned into, I think, seven or eight categories. Um, and then what they do is they turn that into a, a focus group um, kind of uh, survey tool. And they're right now out in the field uh, and they will have 200 uh, interviews and surveys, so it's a combination of in-person or virtual, uh, but also written surveys that will allow them. And this that right now this is with admitted students, people who are admitted to come to Augsburg in the fall. We don't know for sure whether they are going to come to Augsburg or not, which is actually part of why we want that mix, but they have been admitted. So, so the idea will be to test what uh, what won them over, <laughs> and is is it the things that we claim, or is it something else that we maybe missed? Um, and that'll allow us to compare those distinctions to other institutions as well. And then what we'll do next fall and into the winter is they will do a similar project with current students um, to kind of understand what brought them here. Um, and then um, there is a third phase of this. I'm trying to remember. I think it starts next spring. Um, that will look at students who. Um, chose to go someplace else and try to understand. Um, and so the idea is over basically 18 months, what we get out of this is, it's not just a marketing study, but it's actually a positioning distinction study. And then the idea is they will come back with recommendations about what we could do, um, both from a messaging standpoint, but also potentially from a program development standpoint that would enhance and strengthen those distinctions in the market. Um, and um, they have examples of institutions they've worked with. This is the Art and Science Group is the name of the consulting group that we're using, um, where they've actually helped institutions understand how to package what they do and then give it a name, you know, kind of a brand, if you will. Um, and that has itself, it's not like they had to do a lot of new things, but they put things together in a way and then message that out to become a very compelling um, kind of draw for students. And so, you know, and I, I think, Mark, as you've heard me say before, I mean, uh, I love our results. I love the fact that we've got this kind of upward trajectory on, on the moment, but I, we need to know why. Uh, it's such a crowded marketplace. We need to know why, and that's why I made this project the highest priority um, for our investments uh, coming uh, into this year. It's, as you can imagine, it's not not a cheap, <laughs> not a cheap undertaking. So, right. um, but right. we uh, very from what we've seen so far, we we feel like the consulting group has really uh, done a good job of getting who we are and what we think needs to be tested and, 
and we'll get some, uh, I think by August, we'll have some early results uh, from them. Oh, that'd be great. It's good work. Yep. Are other other schools seeing the same kinds of trends in enrollment, or is Augsburg just really unique in the yeah. market? We have, uh, we've outpaced a lot of our competition. Um, you know, and it's so interesting um, because it's, uh, it's probably, you know, school by school, I mean, you know, the, the urban places are doing pretty well. Though St. Kate's has lost some market share, which is interesting because, and our our number of female students has gone up. And so, it, you know, given that they're women only, you know, I wonder if we're capturing more of that market than they have. Um, um, you know, most of our places, they're saying all from Carlton to Max, they have, you know, they're solid numbers and, and there's no issue there. You know, certainly um, there is a challenge on the transfer side because uh, the community colleges have seen dips in their enrollments. And so, you know, our pipelines that we created there, as you, uh, I don't think I put the goals up, but, um, you know, our goal for several years in a row was 195 to 200 transfers. We've, we've now lowered that to 150 to 160. I think you know, that's probably more realistic for us uh, in the short term. So, um, but, yeah. yeah but, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Hey, Paul, I don't want to dominate the questions, but I haven't talked to you for a while. On the DNI side, diversity and inclusivity, as we work with corporate clients, we see a number of different kind of what I'll call ideological platforms of how they adopt it and how they infuse it in their culture. If I were a parent and asking you two questions, you know, kind of what's, what's your ideological platform? Is it critical race theory? Is it, what is it? And then secondly, how does that show up in the life of a student, how would you answer those in like one paragraph or less? <laughs> well, you know, no uh, pressure, man. <laughs> I would say that you know the ideological platform has probably been emerging kind of out of you know because in some ways, if you go back 15 years ago, you know my first uh, fall where we were 18 percent students of color, and then the next year was 25 percent, and then you know then we started to do practical things out in the market that. Um, uh, that built those pipelines that I talked about, um, and all of a sudden the numbers ticking up. You know, I mean, three years in a row, it's been 65 percent students of color in the entering class. I mean, we are now majority BIPOC, um, and so in some ways that has led us now to you know. So early on, we are thinking to ourselves, okay, we just need to build cultural competency, and so we entered into a lot of training programs. We have a very robust you know, you know certificate program that actually a very large percentage of our faculty and staff have gone through, um, which do a lot of training and microaggressions on you know, allyship and all those kinds of things. We use the intercultural development inventory, um, so we've tried to make this non-judgmental to be about growth, and then we support people with uh, with consultants that, that help them to build a plan, personal plan, but then also um, organizational plan. We've built um, uh, commitment to equity and inclusion into our um, uh, performance evaluations for staff. Um, so those were the pieces that were emerging, you know, 10 years ago, uh, as we were starting to see this thing. And then really, um, uh, when the board uh, stepped in and said, we need to understand this work, um, this equity commitment at a kind of even higher governance level, we created a governance task force, a mayor of equity task force, uh, I think four years ago, that was led by Eric Jolly. And that was a, a alums, staff, faculty, and regents that came out with um, a set of, um, of recommendations, a statement about equity and why it was central to who we are, but then a set of recommendations that um, that have in fact now framed the work plan that we have. So I have now a vice president for equity and inclusion, uh, Joanne Week, who has basically um, uh, moved in, grown up here. Uh, she's been here 10, 12 years, and so she's grown into this position. She's now a member of my leadership team. Um, she has a work plan based on those four recommendations, which are um, embed this in the strategic plan, which we did. Um, it's right there, first front and center in the strategic plan. Um, uh, support, uh, create the, the culture and the context that our students deserve, um, you know, around equity. So what does it look like in the classroom? What does it look like in the residence halls? What does it look like uh, in the broader community? Support the equity leaders that you already have on campus. So we have faculty and staff who are remarkable national leaders in this work because they've been attracted to us because of who we are. And I would say that they actually come from a variety of ideological platforms. I mean, yes, there are some critical race folks uh, here, um, but there are also folks who really look at this through a different lens. Um, and it's been interesting to engage that conversation with them. They come to this work uh, for different, uh, with different intentions and different agendas, but ultimately it, as a as a mix, it's a very interesting, um, uh, you know, dynamic, I think, uh, for our folks. Um, 
And then the third piece that is our fourth piece of recommendation that came out of that task force was to to ally ourselves, partner with organizations that share our commitments for the sake of, in fact, um, enhancing this work both at Augsburg and in the broader community. So that's why the Urban Ventures um, Partnership, for example, is a perfect example of that. I mean, we right. share capacity. Um, and I'll be quite honest, I think a certain percentage of our BIPOC population growing at that level um, that it has over the past several years is actually directly linked to the Act 6 program that we run with Urban Ventures because they have mm. a pipeline for us. So we only take seven students a year, but we are the number one choice school actually in the nation for for X6 prospective students. So what happens is we get the spillover effect from that. So, and these are almost all students of color, first generation students. So, so I, I would say that in addition to the seven that we take in any degree, we probably get another 40, 45 or 50 students directly through that program who learn about Augsburg through that program and want to be here. So, so that's the kind of range of things that we're working on. As, as you may have read, we have established this new critical race and ethnic studies program. Um, it will launch in the fall. We are doing a cluster hire of three faculty members, one in Latinx studies, one in um, Pan-African studies, one in uh, Pan-Asian studies. Uh, we have named Bill Green, our wonderful Bill Green, as the inaugural uh, Anita Gay Hawthorne Professor of Critical Race and Ethnic Studies. So he is providing that kind of senior leadership for the formation of this new program. And that's a direct response to both what our current students want, but interestingly enough, it's a direct response to what happened at Augsburg's campus in 1968. Wow. The students, including the June Lang, <laughs> our current board member, actually called on the faculty and the administration to establish a kind of ethnic studies program. And here we are, 53 years later, um, establishing that program and doing it with um, wonderful support from alums and others who, who think that Augsburg, you know, needs to live into that into that aspiration. So, thank you. Well, that, that's more than a paragraph. But <laughs> so, yeah. Good job. Well done. <laughs> Well, if there are no other questions, I was in Zoom meetings, I always like to give people back time, you know, I mean, if you plan for an hour and you get 10 minutes back, you know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. So, um, but I I just want to say again, um, when I look at the uh, list of those of you who are here, you, uh, many of you were on the board when I arrived uh, uh, 15 years ago, um, about this time, actually 15 years ago, and uh, we're so supportive of what we launched the presidency there, and uh, we had some rough moments in those first five or six years where we're trying to <laughs> figure out how we're going to do this work together. But I think uh, once we got that alignment in place, uh, it's been um, just a, a great journey. Um, and uh, and I think uh, we got six important years in front of us here to, um, I think, establish uh, what this all means about Augsburg's future. And I have to say that I'm excited about that work going forward and so grateful for your continued support. So So thank you for that. Thank you, Paul. It sounds like as I listen to you, kind of the two, couple of the two big things are kind of executing this two college model that you talked about, yeah? yeah. And then obviously the financial roadmap on the other side of federal funding, right? right. Yeah. And so it seems to me those are kind of the big, some of, probably some of the big rocks on the roadmap ahead. And the good news is that, that we have a quite sophisticated, uh, relatively new um, chief financial officer who has brought to us a, just a a gift of being able to do financial modeling at a just really deep and sophisticated level, um, which is now, as you know, with any good model, shows us exactly where the vulnerabilities are. Um, and that's this growth sustainability task force. Though that work has metrics linked to it that are actually directly tied to that financial model. So we know exactly what we need to do um, on a variety of fronts in order to come out of next year and know that we have a sustainable future. And we, have, we know what the gaps are if we don't, don't do that. So, um, I mean, this year, if you think about it, I mean, we cut, I'm trying to think of the numbers, like, we cut $12 million out of our expense lines. So no, some of that was just, you know, because you didn't travel, you know, and you didn't have business meetings in some categories. But this this community took some big hits. I mean, we had salary reductions for uh, eight months for all faculty and staff. We suspended 403B contributions for the entire year. Um, uh, we were able to bring the salary reductions back uh, uh, in, February 1, and we will bring all of the um, pension um, contributions back as of June 1. So, but those are huge sacrifices that faculty and staff took here. And so yeah. um, I have to tell you, we, um, I mean, we all took it, but at the same time, I just think that 
you take that kind of sacrifice and then you also see how hard people worked. And um, I we really want to do everything in our power to continue to support these people who have really kept us afloat, um, you know, during a crazy time. So, um, you know, when you start, I'm sure you have this experience, you start looking at gallery views of, um, of fat meetings toward the end of the year and the exhaustion in people's faces. You know, right. That is the hardest thing. And to be able to send them off here for the summer and hope that they are able to get some time for renewal um, and um, taking care of themselves. Well, Paul, I'm going to drop off early, but continue the conversation because I'm going to eat my lunch in yeah. seven minutes before my next <laughs> Zoom. So uh, thank you for putting this together, Paul. Keep these up, by the way. I'd love to just, you know, you know it doesn't have to be, be, be a big fancy agenda, but just yeah. keep us in dialogue. Yeah. Thank you, that, Bill. No, thank Thanks you so much. much. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Well, any other questions excellent well thank you all for joining us again with, with phil's with jess and we will continue to do this it's interesting we, we usually get a different mix of, of, of uh, emeritus regions at each of these that we do so it's kind of fun to somehow um, see who has time available at particular moments but certainly when we get into the fall we'll probably um, Start around with these again, just because there will be much to share about uh, where things stand as we head into the next uh, our 152nd academic year. <laughs> so, um, with 151st in the rearview mirror, we hope, <laughs> and uh, spending more time together face to face. So, but thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Thank everybody. you, Paul. Thanks for your leadership. Good to see you. Thank you.